history of the revival in this country is fascinating. We talked about it uh, last year. If you missed that, check that out on our YouTube channel. It's, it's called Revival in the New Year. Charles Finney is the most well-known preacher of the Second Great Awakening. As a young New York lawyer, he often spent time pondering the, the many quotations of Scripture that he found while examining the judgments and legal codes of his day. And then he began actually reading the Bible daily to augment his study of the law. And one morning, Jeremiah 29, 12 kept running through his mind. You will pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Finney said, suddenly, it seemed as if I met the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. I fell down at his feet and poured out my soul to him. Without any recollection that I had ever heard the thing mentioned by any person in the world, the Holy Spirit descended on me in a manner that seemed to go through me, body and soul. No words can ever express the wonderful love that was poured into my heart. He immediately quit his law practice, started going from town to town preaching the gospel. During one seven-year stretch, it's estimated 500,000 people came to Christ in his revival meetings. I mean, just his. And this is before amplifiers and speaker systems and air-conditioned auditoriums and social media, media to get the word out. I mean, that, six months, the six months that he spent in Rochester is, is the one uh, that really rocked the country. It's been called the greatest period of spiritual awakening in American history. During those months, bars closed, crime dropped by two-thirds, Jails were nearly empty for years afterwards, and at least 1,500 revivals broke out in other towns as a result of what happened there in Rochester. When asked why these things happened, Finney pointed to Daniel Nash. Nash was an unassuming man who would get to town three or four weeks before Finney, rent a room, find a small group of intercessors to join him, and they would start a prayer meeting to plead with God for souls. Once the public meetings began, Nash usually stayed hidden away, praying for the Holy Spirit to melt the crowd. He was affectionately known as Father Nash. He never shared the limelight, but he literally shook heaven and hell because he believed in the power of praying together. I read his biography this week. It, it, it is unparalleled, really, what happened through just this guy and a, and a friend, actually, another guy praying together. Uh, what God did, how they broke through. When I read stuff like that, I think, all right, now it's our turn. I mean, this, this is our time to pray. This is our chance. America needs revival right now more than any time in its history. Lives are being shattered by the dis disintegration of the home, proliferation of porn, the availability of legal and illegal substances to numb us out. I mean, it is time that we get serious and ask God to break in, to send revival, to turn up the light in our homes, and our church. I, in a, I've been asking him for myself, God, break into my heart, in our country. Today, I want to talk to you about the prayers of Scripture that will get us started, particularly the prayers of the early apostles. They give us the words to say that will keep us praying. Peter, Paul, John, the first century apostles saw something so otherworldly that when we read what they've written, it's, it's almost like they're from another planet. You know, you just get accustomed to it, uh, and, and you, you don't realize these words really don't make sense on a natural level. I mean, and the reason they don't make sense to us is because we're not seeing what they saw. The American church has, got, has settled in for this kind of quasi-psychological self-help version of Christianity that doesn't resemble what the early church had. I was pre-reading Romans 6, 7, and 8 this week, and, and Romans 6 was the chapter I memorized as a young guy, and it is just so clear that Paul saw Christianity as a supernatural lifestyle from start to finish. I mean, it's it, nothing natural about it. One we can only enter, one we can only live by the power of the Spirit. If we want to live like Paul lived, we've got to see what Paul saw. And if we want to see what Paul saw, we've got to pray what Paul prayed. I'm talking about asking for a revelation of 
what God did for us in Christ. Paul calls it the mystery of the ages, the new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Some translations say new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. At the moment of conversion, everything about us changes. And to walk that out, our whole mode of operation has to change as well. Paul says, we are to no longer put any confidence in ourselves, in our human abilities. And warning the Christians at Philippi about the false teachers that were going out saying they, they needed to, you know, put themselves under the Mosaic laws and follow all the laws Moses gave. He says in Philippians 3.3, 3, he said, for we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised, are truly Jews, is what he's saying. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. And he spends a large part of his letter to the Romans explaining what that looks like, that we literally can do nothing without the Spirit's power. Jesus said those same words. He said, without me, you can do nothing. Paul tells us what it means to be a new creature, to be seated with Christ in heavenly places and blessed with all spiritual blessings. I've been praying this prayer in Ephesians 1.17 for our church and for myself, and I'll say, God, I ask you for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. Cause me to understand what is the hope of my calling. What does it mean that I'm a part of the riches of Jesus' inheritance in the saints? What is that about? Show me this incomparably great power that is for us who believe. What does that look like in everyday life? What is that about? What, is it, what does it say about who I am to you? Make it real to me. Make it real to us, God. Give us a whole new dimension of understanding about who we are to you. Show us how you feel about us. Make it real. Let us feel what you feel. I ask God again and again and again, and I'm starting to get energy on it. I mean, uh, stuff that I wasn't seeing, you know, is coming back or, or coming online. I, even verses I memorized years ago, I mean, I read it and it's like there are neon parts of that, you know, that just light up. Now, here's why we want to pray like this. First of all, Jesus told us to. In Matthew 7, 7, he said, ask and keep on asking. Knock and keep on knocking, seek and keep on seeking. And he promised, he said, if you do that, the door is going to come open, you're going to receive, things are going to change. Because when we don't, uh, when, we, when we, we don't do that, I mean, we stay in darkness. We stay in a kind of lethargic, dull state of spirituality. When we do, after a while, we start getting light. And when our eyes adjust to the light, suddenly we're seeing 3D instead of 2D. We're looking at that going, I don't see it. I don't see it. You know, I can't imagine that all those squiggly lines, oh, and then the bottom drops out and there it is. There's this thing floating in space. You see it. It's a dimensional shift that happens in our brain. Well, the Bible says that when we're born again, we're no longer of this world. We're new creatures in Christ. The whole way we used to live and operate died and was buried in baptism. That's what baptism is. It's saying, look, I'm, I, that guy no longer exists. A new creature is, is living here. And we're identifying with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And we'll be baptizing after this service. If you haven't done that, you need a point of reference. You need to obey Jesus' command. So, you know, get it done. Paul says, we've been raised to walk in newness of life. We haven't, I, we haven't even begun to plumb the depths of what Paul saw. But it was so clear to this guy. I mean, it was so clear to him, he could go through incredible hardship, torture, deprivation, cold heat, hunger, imprisonment, do it all alone, and call it momentary light affliction. I mean, obviously we aren't seeing reality in the right light. I mean, because we get a little something go bad in our day and we're bummed out. And the, you know, it's, it's, it's the reality shift we need. We need to see that 3D picture. We need to understand what it is that God has done for us and given us in Christ and the authority that is ours. And praying these prayers will get us there. 
I can't explain how that works. I just know it works. We'll see more. We'll feel more. We'll experience more if we continue to pray the prayers of Scripture. One thing I'd suggest is that you come on Sunday night, first and third Sunday of every month. We meet down at the foundry uh, for a time of prayer, and, and uh, we're using worship and mixing singing and prayer and together. We found that just over the years, this just works so much better when we add music and worship and uh, we put that together with prayer. The idea is that we want to keep holding up God's word to him until we are starting to see the realities, these truths, until we're starting to be drawn in to these truths. Here's how I do it. I'll, I'll just start reading one of these prayers right out of the Bible over and over until I have words to say about it. Because that's what I found. I found that, you know, the first time I read through these, I'm looking, I'm just like, you're going, what? I don't even know what I'm asking for here, you know? But I'll read it a few times, and then I'll have a, an idea or a word or, or a couple of phrases to say about it. And what we're going for is that perception shift. What we're asking for, what we're really praying is, God, I want to see this. I want to know this. We need a shift in the way we see God's word. It, it's only boring to us because we're not seeing it. You know, really the, the reason the Bible, many parts of the Bible are boring to you because you don't see it, and I don't see it. And so David said this in Psalm 36, 9, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. We can't see without Holy Spirit illumination. Jesus said, of those listening to his teachings, Matthew 13, 13. He said, those seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not understand. We don't want to stay in that condition. We don't want to be those people. We, we're asking for light, which is revelation, illumination. The reason some of you, or some of what you've been hearing these last few weeks isn't making sense to you right now is because you're trying to get it with your own human reasoning. You'll never see the 3D reality of these truths about prayer without prayer, <laughs> without asking for it, basically. You'll never learn the truth about prayer without asking, praying for revelation. And that means with your mouth, asking the Holy Spirit, illumine me, show me these things. Well, we got about 30 of these prayers in the New Testament. And in the book, Mike says they're a valuable gift to the church. They, they're prayers that burned in God's heart for his people. They give us the language of his heart. And because God never changes, we can be assured that they're still burning in his heart. When the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation, he wasn't just thinking of the Ephesians. He was including us. Paul knows firsthand how much this is going to help us. These prayers are exactly what God wants for the church in this present hour. It's still the language of his heart. I love that. And, you know, if we'll engage with him on this over time, this will become the language of our heart as well. These words will just flow out of us. They'll, they'll make sense. Now, the book highlights three characteristics of these prayers that make them so valuable to us. First of all, when you read these prayers, you notice that they're, the apostolic prayers are God-centered. They're not a single prayer. There's not a single one addressing demons or telling Satan what to do or not to do. They're all addressed to God. The only exception is when a demon spirit is living in a person, tormenting them or creating a commotion. Jesus and the apostles would rebuke the demon, and generally speaking, the demon would leave immediately. All the prayers of Jesus were directed to the Father. He taught his disciples to pray, Our Father, read the rest and say it with me, who art in heaven. So that's where... Our prayers go, the recorded prayers of the apostles are the same. Everyone is directed to God in heaven. Even when it came to spiritual warfare in Ephesians, in his Ephesian letter, Paul's uh, prayers are addressing the Father. Now, I think this is where a lot of well-meaning prayer groups have gone wrong over the years. I've you know, been a part of this kind of stuff as well. In Matthew 18, 18, Jesus says, truly I tell you, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so I've seen groups and probably been a part of it, you know, where we just took that and said, well, we're going to whack out all the weeds in the heavenlies, you know, we're going to get rid of all those demon princes and, 
and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's not a verse you can apply without specific direction from the Holy Spirit. Apart from binding a demon that is oppressing an individual, we are not to address fallen angels and demon principalities unless directed to do so by the Holy Spirit. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about, because some of you, somebody asked the question about this uh, last week. In Ephesians 6.12, the Apostle Paul says this very thing. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil, where? In the heavenly realm. So there's undoubtedly demonic things that go on. I think St. Louis has got a couple of them at least, I mean, that are just really messing with things. And so, you know, they get cleared out as we address the Father in worship and ask for intervention. And here's the way I've been praying it. Lord, rend the heavens. Break down these demon powers that are just blocking your blessing in this city, God, that are keeping us divided and keeping uh, churches divided. That's, that's who we address, though. We address the Father. Uh, it's what happened in the book of Daniel, an entire spiritual war went on in the heavenlies as he's addressing the fathers, he's, as he's praying and fasting and, and worshiping God. Now, I've also learned the hard way that it's always a good idea to get direction from the Holy Spirit about praying for somebody who's demonized as well, because I have had some pretty wild experiences when the person isn't ready for the demon to go, and uh, you're not going to get him out, you know, you're going to just get a ruckus is basically what's going to happen. So it's important to understand that these apostolic prayers are not the sum total of prayer. We, we have the trust prayers where we're addressing the Holy Spirit within us, acknowledging his presence, inviting his leadership. But the apostolic prayers cover the big areas where we want God to be working in and through us as a church. I also don't think God is all that bothered if we address him as Father or Jesus or the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I don't think he says, wait, wrong person, you're dress- I'm not talking to you until you get, get this right. You know, I, I don't think that happened. I believe he can sort it out. I do think it, it is important to understand that our prayers are answered as a result of Jesus' finished work on the cross. That's why we pray in his name, because he has the account in heaven that we're drawing on. We don't have any account up there. You know, it's his account. And uh, so he tells us, come to the Father in my name. Ask anything in my name, and it'll be given. All right, second characteristic is that apostolic prayers, this is interesting, apostolic prayers are all positive. You'll notice when you come across one of these 30 prayers that it's how they're designed. They're, They're asking for something good. They're not praying for the removal of something bad. Paul prays in Philippians 1.9 that your love may abound still more and more. He never asks for hatred to diminish. Now, that's not to say, you know, God will dock you if you unwittingly pray the wrong way, you know, and pray a negative prayer because I got history. I know he hears and and answers negative prayers because I've prayed a few. You know, he sits on the throne of grace, not on the throne of say it just right or forget it, you know, just get out of here. He's exceptionally gracious to us. I mean, this is a relationship. He's our Abba, Father. He's not a vending machine. He's he's our daddy. But having said that, nothing in the Bible is accidental. So the Lord has a reason for these prayers being positive. And once you understand it, it'll be a lot easier to go down this track. All right, here's another example from Paul. Notice he always prays for unity instead of against the spirit of division. This is Romans 15.5, where he prays, may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may be may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He prayed for peace to increase here in Romans 15.13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't find prayers for despair and fear to be removed, because when joy and peace grow, despair and fear go. When unity's in place, division is erased. When love abounds, hatred evaporates. I couldn't think of another rhyme there. I just couldn't get it. (laughs) But it's true, isn't it? 
When love abounds, hatred goes. There aren't any New Testament prayers against sin. They're prayers for holiness and love. 1 Thessalonians 3.13, Paul prays, establish their hearts blameless in holiness. Now, this was a church, there was a lot of compromise in this church. You've got to pray, God, just deal with these people. Convict them of their sin. You know, root out all this wickedness that's going on in this church. What a mess these people are. He didn't do it. He didn't pray, God, bring them to their knees. He prayed, establish their hearts blameless in holiness. Focused on the positive. Now, this really helps me personally when I'm angry or feeling critical and condemning, whether, it, you know, primarily it's toward me. You know, I, I'm critical and condemning of myself, but I'm also critical of others sometimes. And so praying biblical prayers and using positive words d- like this direct my thoughts and my emotions toward mercy and kindness. People can be really annoying. I can be really annoying, you know? I annoy myself, but when I use God-inspired words from Scripture to pray for myself, to pray for other people, it softens my heart. The apostolic prayers school us in love and forgiveness. They heal our hearts. They strengthen our faith. The negative, venting, you know, get it off your chest, let them have it like they deserve it prayers, weaken our faith. They divide us. They, They breed more negativity. Maybe not every time, but, you know, the cumulative effect is that they, they, they really send us the wrong direction. As we become more familiar with the prayers of the apostles and, and the prayers of Jesus, who's also called the apostle and high priest of our confession in Hebrews 3, we become more convinced that these have to be answered. These have to be answered. They, God, is, God is committed to answering these. They were given to us by the Holy Spirit. Believers have been praying them and getting results for 2,000 years now. God, listen, God promises that the end time church will walk in greater purity, power, love, and unity than any other time in church history. That this end time church, when we see all this vortex of, of things in Psalm 2 coming together, which is what we're seeing right now, all the signs Jesus said of the end time, which we're starting to see it all build, this end time church that will come out of this will, will walk in a greater dimension of the Spirit's power and love and purity than at any other time. And the more we pray these prayers for that to happen, the more convinced we'll become that it has to. Our faith will explode. I I noticed this week that there are some of these that I have not been consistently praying. And so I just took the list and I thought, I got to get through this. You know, I'm getting convicted. (laughs) I'm going to be preaching about this and I haven't prayed some of these. And so, you know, I'm walking around my circle and I'm, I'm praying some of these prayers. And I just, I was gripped with how much faith is infused in these words. When you pray the words of Scripture, when you read the words of Scripture out loud, faith comes. That simple act causes faith to rise in your heart. In the book, Mike says, the Father is the great psychologist. He designed these prayers to make human hearts work right and to work together in unity with a spirit of encouragement. It's really true. All right, number three apostolic prayers are usually for the church. They're not for the loss. They're not for the transformation of society. It's not the, to say that God isn't committed to winning the loss and releasing elements of transformation in society. In fact, you know, again, he's not going to dock us if we pray that. In fact, he, he answers those kind of prayers as well. But it is significant to note that the New Testament prayers aren't focused in that direction. Now, the only prayer for lost people is Romans 10, 1, where Paul's praying for Israel to be saved. Now, here's why the focus is on the church. God's primary plan to reach lost people has always been his family. Jesus said, by this will all men know that you're my disciples, by your love for one another. That's, that's what's going to do it. In Matthew 5, 14, Jesus said, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. God's plan is to fill us with so much power and love and light that people can't look away, that they'll be drawn to the light. They'll be drawn to what's in us and want it. I tell you, that's already starting to happen. I mean, the world's getting to be such a dark place. I mean, it's so dismal. And and we want to be blindingly full of light 
and, and life. And when we pray for the whole church in our city to be revived, the answer to that's gonna have a huge impact on the lost community of the whole St. Louis metro area. I mean, we're gonna see multitudes of unbelievers coming to Jesus and our whole society will inevitably change as the church walks in the greater dimensions of the Holy Spirit's power. We see that here in Acts 19. The largest church in the first century was the church at Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey. This city was the third largest uh, in the world at the time. It was like the New York City of that day. And, and it was pagan. I mean, th that's the other thing we don't get. I mean, these people were not just kind of shades of of light, you know, moving from, you know, they were, they were, you know, this denomination that didn't believe in the power of God, and then they got to be this, this, you know, they turned into charismatics. That, that's not what happened here. These people were worshiping idols. They were worshiping devils. And Paul goes in, look at Acts 19.10. It says, so that, uh, he preaches the gospel, and, and the thing explodes, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. Verse 20, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. God's strategy was to raise up out of this pagan culture, this large anointed church with congregations across the whole city who'd win a great harvest in all of Asia. What happened in Ephesus was so powerful that everybody who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord from Paul and others in this church. Now, can you imagine this? To be able to say the word of the Lord prevailed in St. Louis, the word of the Lord prevailed in Los Angeles. The one I'm going to finally believe is the word of the Lord prevailed in San Francisco. Wow. <laughs> My son lives out there. That will, that will be a miracle of Ephesus proportions, I'm telling you. St. Louis as well. I mean, we got a lot of darkness here. Well, it happened. It happened. The word of the Lord prevailed in Ephesus, in this city of paganism. And I believe it can happen here. At the beginning of this revival, Paul's the principal preacher. I mean, he's the guy that comes in, you know, a few of these pagans turn their hearts to the Lord. But for all of Asia to hear the word of the Lord and prevail means this thing went exponential. I mean, it went from addition to multiplication very quickly. I mean, think about the communication and transportation systems of that day. For all of Asia to hear the word, thousands of preachers had to be walking around the power of the Spirit. Paul didn't get on the internet. He didn't get on TV to reach all of Asia. He didn't hop a train and jump off at every town. There were no planes, trains, or automobiles. I mean, this is mostly by foot these guys were getting around. And, and, and so this is no social media, just the church. And and yet everybody in Asia, in Ephesus, heard the word of the Lord Jesus. The word grew mightily and prevailed. That's what we want. That's Peter. That's a kind of revival we want to see right now. We want to see preachers and worship leaders getting fired up and anointed to speak God's word in power. Because I'll tell you what, when that happens, the pews catch fire. I mean, that's when things start to change. When we we start to get juice. We start acting like Jesus. That's when the masses in society take notice and start coming to the Lord. Mike makes a, a really good point in the book saying that when Paul prays for the churches in the cities of Galatia and Ephesus and Philippi and Colossae, he's not praying for one little group. He's praying for the whole city. And when we pray these apostolic prayers, we want to pray for the whole church in St. Louis, not just us. We want... God to visit every one of the 3,778 congregations in this metro area. It's a number I got online. I think that's about right. We're not just asking God, visit us, you know, do it all here. We want, we're, we're looking for an awakening personally and corporately too, but we want the third great awakening in America to happen. We want this thing to do the same thing that happened in Ephesus. When, when this happens... It's going to sweep across our city into hundreds of Baptist churches and Methodist churches and Catholic churches, whoever calls on the name of the Lord. We can ask him to include all the 3,000 plus churches. We can pray the prayer uh, in 2 Thessalonians 3 1. This is one we've been praying that the word of the Lord would run swiftly and be glorified. 
through North County and South County, from the east side to downtown, the central west end to West County, St. Charles, outlying areas. We want all of St. Louis to be ablaze with the gospel. That's what's going to turn the tide. If we are going to see a change in our culture, that's what's going to do it. Power of the Holy Spirit. I'd, I'd love to see thousands of people cramming into this place. But there are 2.8 million people in this area. So we're asking God, send, send your word and your power into all the churches of our city. That all the pastors, all the church leaders would begin to boldly proclaim your word, God, with, without compromise. Without compromise. God is a brilliant strategist. I mean, he tells us, all right, I want you to pray to me in heaven. You know, get your eyes off of all the bad stuff. You know, look, talk to me. Pray positive biblical prayers and focus on the church. And again, that's not all we're to pray, but that's the model presented for us in the New Testament. Now, on the back of your handout, uh, we've included some prayers for a mini prayer walk. We did this the, early, the beginning of last year, and it was unbelievable to see you guys all around the campus just praying for various ministries here. We've got half as many, so this will be a, a lot easier. And uh, the, uh, half as many locations. There's no booklet. It's just the handout you receive. And we won't have sign-ups like we did last time. The idea, however, is the same. In place of prayer points, we've got the apostolic prayers taken directly from the New Testament. We contemplated this. We talked about, you know, kind of dumbing these down and, you know, making them real English, English. But, but I'm telling you, I'm just going to tell you what I'm experiencing. When we do that, something gets lost. Because when you can look at this and know you are praying identically what the Apostle Paul prayed in the early church, and man, I'm telling you, he got some results. There is something powerful about that. So it, yeah, it's a little bit to work through, but again, the words will come to you as you pray these prayers. And so we just kind of left them in Bible form. Uh, so you can start anywhere, any number, you know, you, you can go at this backwards if you want to. Uh, uh, but come early or stay a little afterwards and, and pray these prayers. You can even do it in segments, you know, do two, two this time, two next time, three another time. Uh, do it. We're asking you to try to do it in your small group. Uh, with your small group, if you can't do that, you can certainly do it alone. You can do it with your friends or family. Uh, this auditorium is number one. The prayer chapel is number two. Go and just pray those. Trail ends down at seven, which is the foundry. Our youth meet down there. We meet, have a prayer meeting down there. This is interesting. I, I'm not going to try to explain this because I don't, I don't understand it myself. But when we started praying down at the foundry, it was, we were just plowing through. I mean, it was like breaking up hard soil. I mean, it was just, here, here we are, Lord. We're going to stick at this for two hours and we'd get through it. Something has changed. I mean, something has changed. We do this every week now. We'll go down, a bunch of us, during our lunch hour and, and pray on our Thursday is our fast day around here, and, and we'll go down and, and pray. And I'm telling you, something has changed. There is a breakthrough. I talk about it in the video this week with John. They, they are seeing it with the students. There is a difference in the atmosphere in that building. I'm telling you guys, if we'll start praying over this place, we're going to get some of that disruption, disruption and that distraction and that junk that's going on removed, and we're going to have light in this place. We're going to have a release of God's Spirit in this place, and that's what we're asking. We're asking for God. God, bring the heavens. Come down. Uh, so... Again, it's, these are good prayers to pray for yourself. Keep this, use this for your family, your friends, yourself, our church. I also want to encourage you to start praying the prayers Mike included in the book on page 81. Uh, he only gives you the scripture references, so you, you'll have to look them up. But that's kind of good because seeing them in your own Bible is really he helpful. Now, I'm just going to run just real quick through these. We want to be asking God's, for God's presence to be manifest powerfully in our church services for 
people to be saved and set free of demonic oppression, to be healed of disease, to get refreshed by the Spirit's power during the worship and preaching. We're going to be praying Philippians 1, 9 through 10, that our love will abound and that we as believers will approve the things that God calls excellent, not get caught up in compromise and sin. We're, we're going to pray that the anointing of conviction will rest on the preaching of God's Word so that both believers and unbelievers will be impacted and convicted in, a, in huge ways. We're going to pray John 16, 8 for a spirit of holiness and love to prevail in our church. We're going to pray for a great increase of the gifts of the Spirit. And Colossians 4, 3 and 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, that the Spirit will open more doors for us to be able to minister to unbelievers and that he'll prepare those unbelievers to receive the gospel. We're going to pray that Jesus, what Jesus said in John or Matthew 9, 37, 38, that the Spirit will motivate more and more believers to share the gospel, to give us a burden for lost people, for reaching them. We want to pray Ephesians 1, 17, for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God, for insight into his will and ways to be given to church leaders and to the whole body of Christ in this city. We want to pray Ephesians 3, 16, that believers will be strengthened with might by the spirit in their inner man. And John 17, 21, for unity among all believers and all the families in the church. We want to pray Zechariah 12, 10, for an increase of the spirit of prayer to be released on the church. That's what uh, Father Nash had, this, the Holy Spirit giving us power to pray. I talked about that at one point. I don't know what the name of that message is, but we want that. We want the spirit of prayer to rest on us. We want, we want to pray 3 John 2 for every family to be saved and healed, and for every family to prosper, have secure and steady jobs. Now let's go back to our anchor here, all right? Let's go back to the anchor verse. 1 John 5, 14. I want you to read this with me. All right, here it is. This is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now if we're praying the prayers of Scripture... We are praying according to his will. Is that not right? And we know when we pray according to his will, what happens? He hears us. And when he hears us, it's with approval. When God hears our prayers, it's with approval. There is something so faith-building about praying the prayers of Scripture. Matthew 18, 19, Jesus gave us this promise. He said, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask... It will be done for them by my Father in heaven. If we will pray God's word, agreeing together for this church and the churches of this city, we will not be the same, guys. We will not be the same. There is no possible way the devil and all his angels can stop what God will do if we will ask him, if we will keep on asking, and we will pray according to his will. And we got the prayers, we got the stuff, we got the goods. And it, it's gonna mean turning some things off, because that's the big deal, isn't it? I mean, I don't have the time. Yes, you do, yes, you do, yes, I do. I just have to turn things off. And I'm talking about little things. Like one of the things the Holy Spirit talked to me about one night is, and he's so gentle. It's like, how about instead of the last, the seventh episode of House Hunters, how about turning that one off and let's just talk before you go to bed? And then you know what? I got to where I could turn two episodes off. You know, so I'm telling you, this is addictive. When you begin to connect with the presence of God, it'll draw you in. It'll draw you in. You'll want that. Your sleep will be different. The way you feel will be different. The first step is always prayer. History is clear. The record is undeniable. The blueprint is right in front of us. Every great move of God begins when his people pray. Unified prayer, desperate prayer. It's time to pray for a spirit of repentance and reconciliation. It's time to pray for personal renewal in our own lives. It's time to seek God for spiritual awakening in our time, in our generation, in our churches, in our city, right now. God can do more in a moment than we can ever do in a lifetime.